Well, thank you to Pastor Hadley and the worship team and to Hadley's brother Emmett for blessing us this morning with those songs. Thank you for leading us in worship. I, I could listen to uh, the Dobro all day long. Um, that, that was awesome. Well, we come this morning to our final sermon in our mini-series called Get After It, God's provision for the believer's growth, God's provision for your growth. This is week three of a three-week series, the final message. The objective of this brief series has been to equip you, the believers of Grace Bible Church, with a thorough understanding and appreciation of the resources that God has provided for you to grow in your walk with Christ, to motivate your devotion to Christ, and to cultivate your faithfulness to Christ. The title of today's message is the role of the church, or the church's role in the believer's growth. Friend, you were made to know Christ. You were made to worship Christ. You were made to glorify God by placing your faith in Christ, the sinless and spotless Lamb of God who died on the cross to pay the debt of sinners and who rose in victory on their behalf. All of your life, if you are a believer, should be spent in servitude, slavery, To Jesus Christ. For from him and through him and to him are all things. All things includes you and me. We are to live for Christ. Full stop. He made us. He owns us. He doubly owns us because he bought us at the price of his own blood. He cares for us. He shepherds us. Guides us. Watches over us. And watches over us. And one day will come back for us. It's our joy to live for him. But yet, even for those of us who are believers, because of indwelling sin, because of ignorance, because of laziness, at times, we often fall terribly short of living for Christ the way we ought to. We fail to grow. We fail to mortify sin. We fail to cultivate personal holiness. We fail to avail ourselves of the tools and resources that God has provided for our spiritual growth. My friends, please consider this for a moment. Yes, God is indeed a God of grace, mercy, patience, and forgiveness. And we ought to praise him for that. He is a God of grace, and because of that grace, we are all here this morning celebrating his love for us as demonstrated chiefly in the gift of his son. It is because of his grace that you and I are not in hell this very moment, which is what we deserve. But friends, never, ever, ever use the grace of God as a justification for intentionally being lazy and lackadaisical in your pursuit of practical, daily faithfulness and worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does God forgive us when we are negligent in our walk with Christ? Yes, he does. Should we use the grace and forgiveness of God as a rationalization to be content with spiritual sluggishness? Absolutely not. Remember what God has called you and I to do. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out is a Greek term, karagadzomai, that means to do that from which something results. To do that from which something results, one source says. MacArthur says on this Greek word in one of his uh, discourses, he says, to bring something to fulfillment is what this word means. To bring it to fullness or completion. And what Paul is saying is this, the salvation that is in you needs to be brought out all the way to its fulfillment, to its fullness. This is really a command for sustained effort and diligence in working out or drawing out that what has already been planted within. To work out in your daily conduct what God has already put in in your transformed heart. I am to mine out what is already mine, day-to-day holy living, That's the idea. I am to be committed to the process of my salvation coming to the outside in the sense that it is manifest in my conduct, my behavior, end quote. That's what it means to work out your salvation. 
the practical daily pattern of your life ought to authentically match what has been changed and transformed in your heart. If you're a genuine Christian, then a miraculous work has happened in your soul that you had no control over, but God did it in his mercy. He took out your dead heart of stone that hated him and was indifferent to his law. He reached in, he took it out, he gave you a new heart that wants to obey, that wants to walk in submission to him, that wants to love righteousness and hate sin. And yes, we do stumble because of the principle of indwelling sin. But when we stumble, we loathe it. We confess it. We turn from it. We repent. We submit our lives to Christ continually. And in so doing, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We do acknowledge that God plays a role in our progressive growth. He grows us in our faith. We acknowledge what Philippians 1, 6 says, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. If you are truly, your, uh, truly God, truly God's, then you will not fall away. If you are indeed an authentic living branch attached to the vine, the vine who is the Lord Jesus Christ, then, the, then according to John 15, the divine vine dresser, God the Father, will prune you as he sees fit so that you may bear fruit and thus glorify God. If you truly belong to him, you will never be cast away. God works in us. He grows us. He challenges us. He stretches us and increasingly makes us more like Christ. Now, this being said, God plays a role in our sanctification, but Philippians 2.12 and 2 Peter 3.18, as well as many other passages, also teach us that we play a role in our progressive sanctification as well. 2 Peter 3.18 says that we are called to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is a present active imperative. You do this thing. You do this thing. You grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So yes, we acknowledge the synergistic tension of progressive sanctification. We do recognize that God is indeed working in us while we are also called to work out our salvation. But friends, once more, let, never let us be found using God's role in our spiritual growth as a cover for laziness and a justification for neglecting these clear commands that we've been given. We're commanded to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are commanded to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are commanded to grow in Christ's likeness. So this raises the question, how? How do we do this? If you're serious about this, if you're serious about obedience, you're probably asking, okay, how do I do it? What's next? How do we go about walking in obedience to this command to grow? Well, remember, God is our good shepherd. Just as he leads us by still waters and green pastures, just as he provides guidance and safety through his rod and his staff, just as he sets an abundant table before us in the presence of our enemies, so too he has already provided the resources we need to walk in obedience into the command to grow. Christian, God has graciously provided you everything you need to obey his command to grow in your walk with Christ. If you recall two weeks ago, we looked at the role of the word of God in the believer's growth. The Lord has graciously given us his word as our spiritual sustenance, our food that nourishes us and satisfies us and helps us press on to know our Lord deeper. We study the word of God so that, as one preacher has said, we may know the God of the word. Let me say that again. We study the word of God as one preacher has said, so that we may know the God of the word. Bible knowledge is not an end in and of itself. I hope you don't read the Bible so that you can show up at your, mor um, your morning Bible study and have this cool, neat fact to wow your friends. Have them think that you're the Bible guru. No, no, no. We study the Bible so that we can worship the one who wrote the Bible. We study the word of God, and as we stare at the glory of God written on the pages of Scripture, we are changed and transformed more and more into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Thus, the word of God is absolutely essential for our growth as believers. Last week, Pastor Bryson helped us understand the second gracious provision that the Lord has bestowed upon us to aid us in our spiritual growth. We are privileged to pray. We've been given the word of God, and we are privileged to pray. In the real, authentic worship of the one true God, we have been given access to come before the heavenly throne room and appeal directly to the king of the universe. 
Have you ever read any mythologies or ancient religions written around the time of the New Testament or even before? You had to catch one of the gods on a good day and in a good mood if you expected to get anything from them. Most of the time, they enjoyed being cruel or indifferent or even playing tricks upon humans, the pagan gods of the false religions. But the one true God, the only God, the real God, says, come to me. If you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ... In the same way that the Israelites during the first Passover had the blood spread on their doorposts, if you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, then you can come boldly into the throne room of the King of Kings and ask and pray. We are privileged to pray. There are multiple objectives and purposes of prayer, to be sure, and the chief purpose is the glory of God. But one of the legitimate byproducts of prayer is our increasing growth in Christlikeness. As we cultivate a habit of prayer, we grow in dependence upon God. We grow in humility, which honors Him and kills our pride. We grow in an ever-maturing understanding of His sovereignty and His power. And we grow in an attitude of praise-saturated gratitude. And so, as we saw last week, we need not just a daily habit of reading the Word to grow in Christlikeness, but we need a consistent pattern of private prayer as well. But that's not all. You need the word quickened to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. You need prayer, which is only effective if you are covered by the blood of Christ and are praying in the Spirit. If you are not praying in submission to God, if you're harboring sin, he doesn't listen. Psalm 66 teaches that. But if you are keeping in step with the Spirit, the word has power in your life. Prayer has power in your life. But there's more. There's more. The word is a gift, prayer is a privilege, but these two are not the only means of growth that God has graciously given us. No, there's at least one more source of spiritual growth that we can avail ourselves of, that the Lord has given to us, and that is the local church. The local church. Most Christians will acknowledge, at least verbally, that though they may not practice these disciplines regularly regularly in the privacy of their own home, they will pay lip service to the fact that they absolutely need the word in prayer. But in our Western culture of independence and self-reliance, and in our national culture, and perhaps even our regional Midwest culture of rugged individualism, which values hard work and self-sufficiency, we are less inclined to confess our desperate need for the blessing of the local church. But friends, just as God has given us his word and prayer to help us grow in Christlikeness, the Bible clearly teaches that he's also given us the local church. Let me ask you, Are you personally convinced of your own specific need for the local church? Do you truly believe that you need the church as much as you need scripture and prayer to help you in your walk with Christ? We desperately need the word, prayer, and the church to help us grow. We need these resources to keep us drifting off into spiritual shipwreck and disaster These three provisions, the word, prayer, and the church, have been given us to help us grow and also to help us avoid the tragedy of spiritual destruction. Help us avoid the tragedy of spiritual destruction. You see, friends, submitting your soul to the scripture will keep you from being a hedonist. A daily practice of private prayer will keep you from being a hypocrite. And immersing yourself in the life of the local church will keep you, among other things, from being a heretic. To conclude our three-week study of the gracious provisions given to us by God for our growth, I'd like us to examine the gift of the local church with the hope that you would leave here today convinced just how much you need the local church. Now, one would hope that after the events of 2020, we would never need to cover this issue again. We could simply just say a closing prayer, say amen, and listen to Emmett play more Dobro. (laughs) One would hope that after being forced by the government regulations to cease from meeting in person for 10 weeks in the spring of 2020, from the middle of March to the end of May, we as a church would instinctively, deeply, and even viscerally understand just how much we need, we need the church. And I do think that for many of us, We came out of the events of 2020 resolutely committed to the local church in a way that we weren't before those events. I count myself among that number. I think I had an intellectual grasp of how much we needed the church. But it wasn't until those two and a half months or ten weeks that we weren't with one another. I mean, it was 
you know, as a pastor, you do a lot on Sunday. It was fine after the first week, fine after the second week. The third week, you're like, this stinks. This absolutely stinks. We needed one another, and we were convinced of it in a deep way that we weren't before. Following the events of COVID in 2020, I can confidently say that after we have seen spiritual devastation wrecked in the lives of various precious sheep as a consequence of being separated from the rest of the flock during that time, we can say that the leadership of Grace Bible Church is absolutely committed to the continual assembly of the saints of Grace Bible Church, no matter whatever so-called pandemics and fabricated crises may arise in the future. We as shepherds are encouraged to recognize that many of you, the members and regular attenders of GBC, clearly and evidently share that same conviction of an increased devotion to the regular meeting of the local church in the wake of COVID in 2020. But if I can speak candidly, we as shepherds are also troubled and concerned about others whose lack of commitment to the local church has been exposed by the events of 2020. How do we see this? Well, practically speaking, we see in the proliferation of one-service families, families that perhaps before the pandemic attended church both services, but in recent years have become accustomed to attending only one service on Sundays. We see this in the dearth of nursery and children's ministry volunteers. This is always a need in any church that has children's ministry, but the constant need for volunteers serving in our Grace Bible Church nursery has been quite acute since the pandemic, seemingly more so than before. To be frank, it appears that many who faithfully served in these ministries before we shut the church down have not all returned to these ministries in the past three years. We are often in need of others to fill these opportunities. We chiefly see this in the declining numbers of those attending our Grace Life classes on Sunday mornings. When Grace Life classes began in 2017, we offered four different classes, two for each service, each class with approximately 75 attendees. The total size of our church has not changed over the past seven years. Even when we sent out 40 people to plant a church in Manhattan, we hover around approximately 650 individuals from the youngest to the oldest every Sunday, give or take. But attendance in Grace Life classes has not stayed the same. In the years post-COVID, it has dropped precipitously. Instead of two classes each hour, four total, each with approximately 75 attendees, we now have just one class of around 75 during first hour and another one of around 40 to 50 during second service. To put it another way, attendance in Grace Life over the past few years has decreased from an average of 300 GBC adults every Sunday to an average of 120 GBC adults every Sunday. And I know that those 180 aren't serving in the nursery because we still keep having to ask people to serve in the nursery. <laughs> This raises a question that we as the shepherds of GBC have wrestled with. Do we as a local church actually collectively value the local church? Do we grasp what a gift the church is? Do we cherish the church and understand that imperfect as it may be, this is one of God's gracious provisions given to us to help us grow so that we may glorify God more fully in our short, short time here on planet earth. Are you convinced of this truth? Let me rephrase it more poignantly. Does your personal involvement in the life of the local church reflect that you value the church the way that God does? When something matters to us, really matters to us, we will rearrange our lives around that thing, whatever it may be. If the Chiefs matter to you, you'll rearrange your schedule to be able to watch the Chiefs game. If hunting matters to you, you will rearrange your schedule, save your vacation days, and set aside the necessary financial resources so as to enable you to go hunting. If you're like me and you love watching a mediocre baseball team frustrate you every summer, you will splurge on MLB TV and set aside time to watch baseball. It is an inescapable truth of the human condition that we all reflect our deepest values in our consistent and habitual actions. Let me say that again. It is an inescapable truth of the human condition that we all reflect our deepest values in our consistent and habitual actions. What you habitually do reflects what you love. There are seasons where we can't be as involved as we like. I understand that. I understand that. But over the long pattern practice of time, you are what you do. You are what you do. So friends, let me ask you again, are you convinced that you need the local church for the sake of your own personal spiritual growth as much as you need the word of God and a practice of private prayer? 
It's my desire that we all be convinced of our need for the church in our lives. God has graciously given to you and to me his bride, his body, his flock to help you in your walk with Christ. What a privilege we have. What a privilege we have to be involved in the life of the local church. So to help us examine this third and final provision for our growth this morning, I'd like to ask and answer three crucial questions regarding the local church. Three crucial questions regarding the local church, and each one of these will have some subpoints. The first is, how does the Lord view the local church? How does the Lord view the local church? Second, how does the local church help us grow in Christ-likeness? How does that actually work? And third, What must be our participation in the local church? What does it look like to be involved in the local church in a way that honors God? Three crucial questions regarding the local church. And we're going to be looking at all of Scripture, predominantly the New Testament, because that's when the church begins, but we'll be looking at all of Scripture. First, let's ask, how does the Lord view the church? What does God think of the church? What does God think of the church? If we're to fully understand what role the church should play in our own personal growth and sanctification, we must grasp how God himself views the local church. Now, I've been using the term church interchangeably with both the church universal, but when we're talking specifically about the role of the church in your life, we're usually referring to the local church, which is the localized expression of the universal church. The universal church is every genuine, authentic believer who's been born again, scattered across the place of the planet Earth. The local church is the collection of believers in a given place who come together, they fellowship together, they listen to the same preaching, they serve together, they sit under the same leadership. There are differences in local churches in place to place. Faithful churches are those that believe the real gospel, submit to Christ, take sin seriously, pursue personal holiness, submit to the Lord, practice the Lord's table and baptism. That's what constitutes a faithful local church. So from here on out, when I use the word the church, I'm usually referring to the local church. How does the Lord view the church? If you've taken our membership class, then much of the points we're about to say are going to sound familiar to you. We cover this material, which is derived originally from Pastor Bart's 2017 Membership Matters sermon series in our membership class. Nevertheless, though this may be repetitive for some, maybe most of you, it is helpful for all of us to review just what God thinks of the church so that we may view the church rightly in our own estimation. I hope there would be no difference, maybe difference in degrees, because we struggle with sin and God is holy, holy, holy. But at least in our affection, there's no difference in our affection for the church than God's affection for the church. First, the church is his collection of called out ones. The church is his collection of called out ones. Matthew 16, 13 through 18. Let's look at one of the first times the Lord Jesus uses the word church. One of the first times the Lord Jesus uses the word church, even before the birth of the church, Jesus is speaking about something he's going to do, something different. Something unlike that he has already done. In the Old Testament, he worked through a people, Israel. One specific place, one specific ethnicity. If you wanted to be right with God, you needed to become an Israelite from the heart. But Jesus told the woman at the well and his disciples over and over that he was doing something different, something new. And he starts to speak. We see this in Matthew 16 and then later in Matthew 18. He starts to speak of a group of individuals he calls his church. And he uses this term, church. What is this term? Well, let's look at the text, Matthew 16, 13 through 18. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or Simon son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus uses a specific term, church. It's the Greek word ekklesia. Why mention the Greek word? Because you break it down, you actually understand what it means. Ek means exit or out of, where we get exit, or if you've ever had anything taken out of you, it's an ectomy, right? Ek is out of. Klesia, or it comes from kaleo, which means to call. Actually, the, the Greek word call reflects, I mean, the English word call reflects the Greek word klesia, kaleo. Ekklesia, those who have been called out of. The church that belongs to Christ is a group of people who've been called out of something and into something. What have we been called out of and what have we been called into? This is the gospel. 
We've been called out of death into life. We've been called out of darkness into light. We've been called out of slavery to sin into slavery to righteousness. We've been called out of rebellion into submission to the king of kings. We've been called out of the state of being orphaned into being adopted into God's loving family. We've been called out of hopelessness into joy. We've been called out of despair into an inheritance stored up in heaven for us. We've been called out of having nothing into a state of having been lavishly blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. This is what you've been called out of, and this is what you've been called into if you are a genuine Christian. That's why God calls you the church. We say that word so often, it loses its meaning. But you've been called out of something into something by God, and you belong to him. He says, my church, I will build my church. It belongs to him. And he promises in that one short statement to safeguard the church and support the church and protect the church until he comes again for the church and takes the church to be with him forever in heaven. He loves the church. He called the church. He nourishes the church. He cares for the church. The church is built on the Christological confession that Peter says here when he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus is our foundation. The confession that Peter made, you know, the Catholic Church gets it wrong. It says Peter's the rock. Peter's not the rock. He's the little pebble. The rock is the confession that Peter made, the one that was divinely revealed to him by God the Father, that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth was not just a mere man. He was fully man as our representative, but he was the eternal, existing, second member of the Trinity, the Son of God who has always existed who at the right time in history took on flesh, became one of us so he could be our substitute, completely obeying the law of God on behalf, where you and I fail every single day. He ran the race to perfection. And then at the right time, he yielded up his life and paid the debt, not just being nailed to a cross, but taking on the curse of God. I deserve to be cursed forever in hell. You deserve to be cursed forever in hell. But for three hours on the cross, as darkness covered the land, Jesus took that curse on himself as he hung there on the tree. And now if you come by faith to Jesus Christ in repentance, bowing the knee to him, you can be forgiven. And God will call you out of darkness into his kingdom. And you'll be part of the church. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, God is calling to you. It's not a mistake that you came here today on this frigid day. That you survived the icy roads. You came here, you sat in this church, you got a seat. God wants you here because he's calling to you to come to his son and become part of his church. And for those of you who have repented, don't lose sight of the fact that you're one of his called out ones. He loves you. He died for you. He cares for you. You're part of the church. We've got to keep moving. The church is not just the group of the called out ones. It's his body. The church is Christ's body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, and Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, and many other passages, Romans 12, describes the church as the body of Christ. What does it mean that we're the body of Christ? It means that we're precious to God. We could spend a long time in 1 Corinthians 12, which actually emphasizes, excuse me, emphasizes the idea that we need one another. We all have different roles. We all have different functions. I love watching football and watching football with my kids and explaining to them those skinny little receiver guys are just as important as the big fat linemen. Everybody's got a different function. Everybody's got a different role. In basketball, you all have to be in shape. Not so in football. Football's more godly, therefore, right? There's different roles, different functions, and everybody works together towards the common goal of building up one another. That's what a team looks like, but more so the church. The eye needs the hand. The hand needs the foot. 1 Corinthians 12, 21, the eye, not, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. You know, verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. 1 Corinthians 12, as well as Ephesians 4, build us on this idea that we are the body of Christ. Every member precious, every member important. And in Ephesians 4, Paul emphasizes the idea that Christ is the head of the body. He sets our direction. We take leadership from him, guidance from him. Nourishment and sustenance comes through him. Our direction, our sustaining grace comes from our head the one who is in charge of the body, the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is his collection of called out ones. It's his body. We've got to keep moving. It is his precious bride. 
It is his precious bride. In the book of Ephesians, we see that the body metaphor is not the only descriptive term that Paul utilizes to describe the church. In addition to being the body of Christ, the church is furthermore described as the bride of Christ. Now, give you a big picture of Ephesians in just a crash course. First three chapters are the what of the gospel. What has God done for you in the gospel? It goes all the way from eternity past until eternity future. God has done everything for you in the gospel. Beginning in chapter 4, there's a pivot. Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, I urge you, therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So beginning in chapter 4, moving onward, we have this explanation of what it means to live as a Christian in light of the gospel. Do you know what the very first area of Christianity Paul begins, what he dives into, beginning in verse 2 of chapter 4? Your involvement in the local church. I think if any of us wrote Ephesians, we talk about your individual responsibilities. But right away, chapter 4, verse 2, Paul dives into the local church. And we just talked about that, how the church is Christ's body. Then Paul talks about later in chapter 5 and into chapter 6, how the gospel affects family life. Specifically, how it affects marriages. The primary teaching of Ephesians 5, through 32 is how husbands and wives should treat one another. But Paul uses an illustration To help the Ephesians understand how the husbands should treat the wives and the wives should treat the husbands, he uses an illustration that actually opens a window for us into Christ's heart for the church. And in his illustration, in teaching on the issue of marriage, Paul helps us see just how Jesus feels about the church. And if we claim to follow Jesus and walk in his footsteps, if he really is our Lord, then our affection for the church should at least echo his affection for the church. Let's pick it up in verse 25 of chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water, excuse me, washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, man shall, excuse me, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast. Oh, man, this is great. This didn't happen first hour. Stas, my water's like right there. Oh, great. It's the last time I asked Stas. Okay. Hey, the church, we need each other. There you go. Living illustration. All right. (laughs) Um, Where was I? Therefore, the man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Friends, can you see the value and love that Jesus places on the church? He loves the church so much that he died for the church. He did so for the church's own good. He loves the church so much that as verse 29 says, he continually cares for the church. He nourishes it. He cherishes it. He did not hold back anything that was necessary for the church's well-being. And yet sometimes we're tempted to make church fit around our schedule. Christ held nothing back. And sometimes we hold everything back. Too often, believers devote themselves far too much to parachurch organizations and Christian ministries outside the local church, to the neglect of the local church. Now, you're listening to a guy who went to a Christian school, K-12, through and I loved it. Then I went to a Christian college, and then I worked at a Christian college, and I went to a Christian seminary, and I worked at a Christian seminary. In fact, my only non-Christian job was folding t-shirts at Old Navy, right? So I know about parachurch ministries. I know about parachurch ministries. I like parachurch ministries. I'm not slamming parachurch ministries, but we can never let parachurch ministries replace our involvement or supersede our involvement in the life of the local church. If you get your sense of Christian community from a Christian school or a Christian college more so than from the local church, you've put the cart before the horse, You're more interested in the bridesmaid than the bride. These things are the bridesmaids, not the bride. Parachurch ministries are good and fine in their own spheres, and they accomplish worthwhile goals. But they are not Christ's bride, and they do not have the promise of Jesus that the gates of hell will never prevail against them. Seminaries compromise. Christian schools apostatize. Christian colleges shut down. The church will never fail because Jesus loves it, died for it, and sustains it to the end. That's where our focus should be. 
That's where our primary focus should be. Next, the church is Christ's flock. John 10, 11 through 17. In John 10, Jesus is confronting the self-righteous, hypocritical religious leaders of his day, the false shepherds of Israel. Jesus sets up a deliberate contrast between himself, the true shepherd, and these hypocritical fakes when he says, John 10, 11 through 17, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me. Because I lay my life down that I may take it up again. We see here that the Lord Jesus is indeed the good shepherd of the sheep. And therefore, we are his precious flock. He cares for the flock. In contrast to the hired hands who care nothing. He fights for the sheep against wolves. Whereas the hired hands would simply scatter. He will even lay down his life for the sheep. Whereas the hired hands seek to save their own skin. Jesus intimately knows his sheep. And they know him to the point that they can hear and recognize his voice amid the din and racket of this world. He knows each one of his sheep individually. If you're a Christian, he knows you individually, and he's called you out by name. You've been predestined to be one of his chosen ones. He's called you out one by one to be part of his flock. Look how much he loves you. Look how much he loves you. John 10 is a developed theological commentary on the shepherding care of God, which is described in Psalm 23. In other words, John 10 builds on the theology laid down in Psalm 23. And you know how much Psalm 23 describes the Lord's care for his sheep. That's how much Jesus loves his church. Do you love the church as well? Now, you might be thinking, I thought this sermon was supposed to be about my spiritual growth. Why have we been spending so much time on what God thinks about the church? Let's put it this way. Unless you're convinced of the value of something, you won't utilize it. If you're not convinced of the value of a healthy diet, you won't eat healthy. If you're not personally convinced of the merits of exercise, you won't hit the gym or the treadmill. And if you don't value the church in the pattern and way that God values the church, you'll never utilize it. It's no wonder that so many people are struggling with growth when they don't value the local church. A resource has been placed before you, bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, here to help you grow. Among other things, the primary goal is to give glory to God, but a secondary goal is to help you grow. And we let it sit. So you may ask then, how does the local church help us grow? How does this actually happen? In the time we have left, let's look at this. How does the local church help us grow in Christ-likeness? As we said at the outset, God has given us his word and his prayer to help us grow more into the image of his son. We understand how the word helps us. We understand how prayer helps us. But how does the church help you grow in your faith, Christian? We could spend an entire month of sermons on this topic. But let's briefly consider four ways that the local church helps you grow in your pursuit of Christ-likeness. First and foremost, the church helps us grow by being the primary venue in which the transformative word is taught. The church helps you grow by being the primary venue in which the transformative word is taught. Can you hear the word of God elsewhere? Absolutely you can. You can download podcasts and sermons. You can listen to sermons on YouTube or on the internet. You could go to Christian camps. You could go to a Christian college that has great chapel messages. There are other venues to hear the word of God, and that's good. I'm not trying to dismiss those. But the pattern we see in the New Testament is that it is the church that is entrusted with the proclamation of the word of God. 1 Timothy 4, excuse me, 3, verses 14 through 15. Paul says to Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. A pillar and buttress, what is that? Just as a pedestal in a museum serves to put on display a work of art that sits on top, so too it is the joy of the local church to put on display and to hold forth the life-changing word of God. We are, as described in Revelation 2 and 3, a lampstand. The light doesn't come from us, but we get to put the light on display. The role of the local church is to give glory to God by proclaiming the truth. And if you were with us two weeks ago, you know how the word of God changes a person. Come to church 
a faithful church that preaches the word of God. And if you come with a humble heart, desiring to make much of Christ, you will be changed. You will be transformed. I know that many of you in this room can testify to the work of God through men like Rick Gertzen and Bart Horton in your life as not because of anything special about them, but because they simply preach the word of God, you grew. Secondly, the church helps us grow by being the chief arena in which we utilize our spiritual gifts. We could look at many passages. Some would include Romans 12, verse 3 through 13, 1 Peter 4 through 7. But we are called to put our spiritual gifting into practice. It is a command. It is a command. Let's just look at this. Uh, Romans 12, verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Friend, if you're not involved in church, if you come as minimally as possible, if you view attending church as checking a box and you are a genuine Christian, then at best, you're not fully living in obedience. How can you use your spiritual gift in the arena of the local church if you're never at church? You can't. There are so many one another's we've been commanded to do. So many one another's, over 50 of them in the New Testament, love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, comfort one another, admonish one another, exhort one another, share with one another, pray for one another, confess your sins to one another, submit to one another. How can you do these 50 plus one another commandments if you're never involved in the church or if you barely come? It's as you exercise your spiritual gift and as you practice the one another's, you will find yourself stretched you will find yourself taxed. You will find yourself in the good type of exhausted, the type that Jesus said to his disciples when they had fed the 5,000, come away and rest for a while. If you never use your muscles, they're going to atrophy. And if you never use your spiritual gift, you'll never be stretched. You'll never be taxed. You'll never grow. You'll stay a spiritual baby. You've been given a gift. You grow as you use it. You use it in the arena of the local church. Next, the church helps us grow by being the institution from which we receive faithful shepherding from qualified leaders. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. This is the idea of tracing. When you as a little kid learned how to trace your letters, you had the dotted line and you wrote a pencil line over the dotted line. That's the same idea of imitating their faith. People over you in the Lord who live godly lives, who are not perfect, not perfect because none of us are perfect, but are worthy to be emulated. You can't imitate the faith of somebody you're never around. Be involved in the life of the local church. Come to Wednesdays. Come to Grace Life. Come to Grace Group. Please. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning that would be no advantage to you. Fourth, the church helps you grow by being the fellowship from which we receive healthy accountability and encouragement from other believers. It's not just from pastors and shepherds that you are the iron sharpening iron. It's, it's those around you. It's the fellow believers you rub elbows with. We look at Matthew 18, the passage on church discipline. More specifically, Galatians 6.1, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Titus chapter 2 describes different demographics in the local church. Younger women, younger men, older women, older men, and how these different demographics bless one another. Specifically, the older helping disciple the younger. That disciple term, if you're not familiar with it, it may sound daunting. I don't know what it means to disciple someone. Let me help you. If you've walked with Christ for any amount of time, I'm pretty sure we can find somebody who's not walked with Christ as long or as deeply as you have. And you can turn around and help them. Help them understand what it means to fight sin and hate sin. Help them understand what it means to glorify God in the workplace or in the home. Help them understand what it means to be a godly mom or a godly dad. You don't need to have a seminary degree or even a Bible college degree to be a discipler. You just need to have walked with Christ for any amount of length of time and a willingness to open yourself up to somebody not as mature as you and to help them along. And then in turn, you may have some weakness that they can speak to. Discipleship is not always a one-way thing. Sometimes it's a mutual iron sharpening iron. But it can't happen if you're not here. And you won't grow if you're not here. So that brings us to our final question. And very quickly, our final four subpoints in the next two minutes. What must be our participation in the church? First and foremost, we must love the church because we first love Christ. 
I, I, I don't, I know we've dealt with some heavy things today. If you leave today with just guilt, like, oh, guilt, guilt, guilt. Maybe there should be guilt if you're actually sinning. Guilt is not always bad. If you're sinning, guilt is good. But the primary takeaway shouldn't be guilt. I want you to love the church because you love the one who is the Lord of the church. You should love the church because you love Jesus. Satan tempts us to view all the things about church that are just secondary and inconsequential. One of my favorite books is The Screwtape Letters. Bear with me. I'm going to read you from The Screwtape Letters. Um, if you've read The Screwtape Letters, the, the way it's set up is an older demon, Screwtape, writing to a younger demon, Wormwood, about how to tempt his patient. That's a, he's a new convert, a new Christian, how to tempt the patient. So listen to this. This is, just, this is awesome. Screwtape says to Wormwood, One of our greatest allies at present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her, spread through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempters uneasy. But fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. All your patient sees is the half-finished sham Gothic building on the new estate. When he goes inside, he sees the local grocer, with rather an oily expression on his face, bustling up to offer him one shiny little book containing a liturgy which neither of them understands, and one shabby little book containing corrupt texts of a number of religious lyrics, mostly bad, in very small print. When he gets to his pew and looks around him, he sees just that selection of his neighbors whom he has hitherto avoided. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbors, make his mind flit to and fro between an expression like the body of Christ and the actual faces in the next pew, it matters very little, of course, what kind of people that next pew really contains. You may know one of them to be a great warrior on the enemy's side. No matter. Your patient, thanks to our father below, is a fool. Provided that any of those neighbors sings out of tune, or have boots that squeak, or double chins, or odd clothes, the patient will quite easily believe that their religion must therefore be somehow ridiculous. That's what the evil one wants us to think of our brothers and sisters in the church, that it's inconsequential, that it's trivial, that it's not as flashy or as polished as something the world would offer. But listen to what Spurgeon says. Spurgeon says this to believers, give yourself to the church. You that are members of the church have not found it perfect, and I hope that you feel almost glad that you have not. If I had never joined a church till I had found one that was perfect, I would have never joined one at all. And the moment I did join it, if I had found one, I should have spoiled it. For it would not have been a perfect church after I had become a member of it. Still, imperfect as it is, it is the dearest place on earth to us. All who have first given themselves to the Lord should as speedily as possible also give themselves to the Lord's people. If you love the Lord of the church, love is bride. And it's imperfect, full of hypocrites. To one degree or another, as one preacher said, we're all a hypocrite. But God bought us with his blood. Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Second, we must not be content with mere attendance in the church, but we must press on towards involvement in the life of the local church. Let me ask those of you, and I'm not talking to new visitors or people who are still checking the church out. People who have been here three months, four months, five months, even six months. If you're still trying to figure us out, that's okay. But people who have been here an extended amount of time. If you're not yet a member, why not? I'm the pastor over membership just because none of the other pastors will take it. Um, but come talk to me. I'll buy you lunch. And you can tell me why you're not yet a member. I would love to hear it. How long have you been coming and just attending? Are you serving in any way? Does anyone know you well enough to pray for you? Does anyone know you well enough that if you were struggling or having a hard time physically, financially, that they would be there to help? We would love to help. But this is a long story and I'm already over time. When Anna and I were expecting our first child, we had to go to this thing at the hospital about having your first baby, and the person running the thing was saying, you know, after the baby's born, you're going to need someone to help with meals, someone to help with laundry, someone to help with this, and there was this sweet girl all by herself. She was expecting, and she just had this look of like, like a deer in the headlights. She says, who helps with this? Is there, is there a service I can call? And I just remember sitting there thinking like, wow, have I taken for granted the local church? Does anybody know you well enough to help you? It may be that we've failed and we've let you fall through the cracks, and if that's the case, I'm sorry. But usually people who fall through the cracks are doing so because they want to fly under the radar. Friends, don't be content with just occupying a seat in church. Press on towards involvement in the life of local church. Join a grace group. Come to Grace Life. Third, 
We must serve in the church out of a joyful heart of worship and self, selflessness, not obligation. In that same vein, if you're feeling obligated because the preacher made you feel bad and that's the only reason, no, 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 no. Serve because you want to give an act of worship to Christ. Be involved in the church because you love the Lord of the church. Fourth and finally, we must readily receive with humility the transformative words spoken to us by both leaders and fellow church members. Ephesians 4 makes it clear, as we speak the truth in love to one another, we are built up in the image of Christ. Don't be so proud as to think you can't receive truth from the person sitting next to you. We're called to counsel one another and speak the word to one another so that we can be less like our old sinful selves and more like the Lord Jesus. But you can't do that if you're not here. So be in the word, be in prayer, and be at church. Let's grow together and let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time spent this morning, this time in this three-week series. I pray that we would be faithful stewards of these disciplines of grace and growth that you've given to us so that you would get the glory. I pray this in your name. Amen.